Calvary Church is dedicated to doctrine, and we want you to experience the life change that comes from knowing God's Word and applying it to your life. So we explain the Bible verse by verse, every chapter, every book. This is Expound. We are in 2 Kings. We begin in chapter 11, a chapter I wanted to go through last week. I wanted to do two chapters, but I'm an optimist, so we have chapter 11 and 12 before us tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Father, for your word. Strengthen us as we study it. In Jesus' name, amen. I came across an article this week in a little periodical called Integrative Medicine. And it was what the, the article it grabbed my attention because it, it was called, Are You Destined to Be Like Your Mother? And it was an article by a woman, two women, asking the question, are you destined to be like your mother? And I have met women who cringe to think that they would be like their mother. And the great insult is for someone to say, you're just like your mother. And they would hate that. Um, and so the article got my attention, are you destined to be like your mother? And the article went on to say, well, in certain ways, yes. Uh, it has been found by the medical profession and the psychological profession, these people who study such things, that if, for example, your mother was a smoker, you have a higher chance of becoming a smoker. Uh, if your mother cohabitated before uh, marriage, or that is lived uh, without being married to the fella, you have a 57% higher chance of doing that as well in future relationships. If your mother got pregnant as a teenager, you uh, are more likely to be a pregnant teenager. On and on and on, it followed that in certain behavioral cases, yes, you are destined to be like your mother. And um, there's even a, a, a word called matrophobia. That is the morbid fear of turning out like your mother. That's an actual condition that some people have, matrophobic. I'm so afraid I'd be like my mom. Well, that is not the problem with the girl that we're about to read about. She is not matrophobic, she is uh, a, a matrophiliac. She wants to be like her mother, and she's so much like her mother, it's scary. The mother I'm talking about is Jezebel. The daughter I'm talking about is a girl named Athaliah. Athaliah, I mentioned her before, and now she is highlighted in chapter 11. Athaliah is not a descendant of King David. It should be a red flag. Because we're dealing with the monarchy, the kingdoms of the south, Judah, as opposed to the kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes in the north. The two tribes down south, Judah and Benjamin, you remember, were always to have on the throne somebody from the lineage of King David. Athaliah is not of the lineage of King David. She is of the lineage of King Omri in the north. King Omri had a son named Ahab. Ahab married Jezebel. Ahab and Jezebel were Athaliah's mother. Athaliah is on the throne in Judah because her husband, by the king by the name of Ahaziah, married her to have a an agreement with the north, probably to strengthen the two kingdoms, but it ended up, as you'll see, greatly weakening the southern kingdom. So, when, verse 1, chapter 11, Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal heirs. This is one of the most significant verses in all of the Old Testament. 
Ahaziah, her son, was the king of Judah whom Jehu killed. Remember, Jehu was the one that killed King Jehoram in the north, and Ahaziah was there to pay respects to Joram, and so when Jehu saw him, he killed him too. So who's left? The queen mother is left. Athaliah is left. And Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead because Jehu knocked him off. She arose and destroyed all the royal heirs. Why is this significant? Because it would seem, if indeed, she has killed all the royal heirs. First of all, do you know who we're talking about here? All of her grandchildren. Can you imagine what kind of a grandmother would rise up and murder all of her grandchildren? One who has matrophilia. One who so wants to be like mom, that is Jezebel, in control, brutal, vicious, holding on to power at all costs. Nothing means more to you than holding on to that power and killing anybody who could vie for that power or be a contender for the throne. All the royal heirs, all the seed of David. Why is it one of the most important verses in the Old Testament? Because God made a covenant with King David. And the covenant with King David is that no one will be lacking from sitting upon the throne of David. In fact, God promised to the seed of David an everlasting kingdom. That's the promise of the Messiah. If all of the royal heirs are dead then God's plan is thwarted. It's over. Athaliah is an agent of Satan to try to destroy the seed that would crush the head of the serpent. Remember that promise back in Genesis chapter 3. It's called the Proto-Evangelion, the first mention of the gospel in its, in its nascent form. It's the promise that some seed is going to be born, some child is going to be born who's going to end the reign, the satanic reign on the earth. That's the Messiah. Then God further explained as the scriptures went on that he would choose the tribe of Judah and out of the tribe of Judah, King David and his lineage. But now, Athaliah, as an agent of Satan, wants to eliminate anybody because she wants to hold on to power, but she is being used by Satan to put an end to the promises of God. Now, if you go all the way in your mind, you don't have to turn there, to Revelation chapter 12, you remember that the Apostle John has in his vision, his eschatological vision, he sees a dragon and the dragon is poised in front of a woman who gives birth to a male child. The male child is destined to rule all the nations. That is the seed of the woman who would crush the head of Satan. And here's that dragon ready to pounce as soon as the child is born. And we know that when Jesus was born, Herod the Great wanted to destroy all the babies in Bethlehem to put to death any possible contender for the throne in Judah. Same kind of an idea. An agent of Satan to put to death the one who would fulfill God's promise. And if you remember, we gave a premise when we studied that section of scripture. And the premise is this. If God's plan of redemption required the existence of a nation and the continuance of that nation, if you destroy that nation, God's plan is thwarted. That's why Satan has attacked Israel from the beginning, still attacks Israel to this day. Because of all the promises God gave to Israel, but here specifically to King David, that there would be there would be somebody sitting on that throne who would rule. Well, if you, if you destroy all the royal lineage, then there will never be a future. 
There will never be a future salvation. There will never be a future deliverer. There will never be a future kingdom. So if she destroyed all the royal heirs, it would seem at this point God's plan is over until you get to verse 2. And aren't you glad that verse 2 begins with that negative contraction, but? All the royal heirs, it seems, are destroyed, but Jehosheba, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, that is her nephew, Jehosheba's nephew, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered. And they hid him and his nurse in the bedroom from Athaliah so that he was not killed. Now understand what we're dealing with. The line of King David is now reduced to a single individual. All of them are killed except one. So one tiny thread upon which all of the future promises of God hang and his name is Joash. And he is hidden away. It says they hid him and his nurse in the bedroom. Josephus explains in his histories, his antiquities of the Jews, that this isn't a bedroom like you and I think of a bedroom. This is a room in the temple where furniture and mattresses were kept, couches were kept basically, seating, and they were stored. It was a storage room in the temple. So this kid grew up without Athaliah knowing it and was sequestered away in the temple. That's where he grew up. So he was hidden with her in the house of the Lord for six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. Six vicious, brutal years of Athaliah's reign. Six years during which time the people of God were think, thinking, it's over, can't trust God's promises, they're broken. God promised the lineage of King David. All the royal heirs are destroyed. God cannot keep his future promises. There is no hope left. Six years thinking there's no hope. Now, they didn't know that there was this kid being hidden away. They couldn't see it. Nobody knew that. It was kept secret for obvious reasons. But imagine being a priest, a prophet, a devoted Jewish person who believed in Scripture, believed in the promises of God, believed in being faithful to God, and then you get the news one day, there are no more royal heirs, no one from David's line left, they've all been killed. If you know the promises of God, then you must be thinking month after month, year after year, there's no future hope. Maybe this is all a religious sham that I'm believing in. Now, I hope you get a little comforted and excited about this idea because there's a lot of things in life you don't see and you don't know, but you, you look at things and the situation looks bleak and you think, oh, how could God do anything with this? I mean, this is the worst ever. Well, there's some things you don't know. There's some things hidden away from you that God will reveal at the right time. God's promises are never bankrupt. God's promises are never not going to be fulfilled. God always has a plan. But for six years, you got to know the people of God were so discouraged. So he was hidden with her in the house of the Lord for six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. In the seventh year, Jehoiada, now Jehoiada happens to be the priest, the high priest. Jehoiada is married to this gal Jehosheba. So J and J. There's a lot of J names, by the way, in this book. And if you're wondering about that, like Jehoash and Jehoram, that's because of the name of the Lord that is attached to their name. So Jehovah uh, is the old pronunciation. We would say Yahweh is the more 
correct Hebrew translation. But they're the names of these people um, often have incorporated the name of God in them. So like, like uh, Joash or Jehoash uh, is another rendering of that, means the Lord upholds. So they take the name of the Lord and incorporate that into the person's name. And so that's why there's a lot of uh, uh, J um, words or names in the, in the Old Testament. So in the seventh year, Jehoiada, that's the high priest, Mary Jew, Jehosheba, the, ga, the gal who takes this little boy. In the seventh year, Jehoiada sent and brought the captains of hundreds of the bodyguards and the escorts, brought them into the house of the Lord to him, to the little boy, to the seven-year-old king. And he made a covenant with them and took an oath from them in the house of the Lord and showed them the king's son. Showed them the king's son. For six years, these guys are thinking there's no hope, there's no promises, there's no future kingdom. And then one day the high priest introduces the future hope. Just imagine after six years of believing there's no hope to be introduced to the seed of David. Hey, you guys, let me introduce you to Joash. This is the royal heir. This is from the lineage of King David. This is the royal line. <gasps> You're kidding. We thought they were all dead. For six years, we thought they were all dead. Can you imagine? The excitement, the joy, the thrill of knowing God does have a plan. He is working. There is one who is going to fulfill all the promises that God made to King David. You and I are here tonight because of the courage of Jehoshaphat. You and I are here tonight believing in Jesus Christ because this woman preserved this one little boy, and Jesus Christ derives his lineage from him. All of the hope of mankind seemed to be put out, but there was one little boy. And the courageous act of this one woman and her husband hiding this boy away for seven years in the temple. And then comes the day where he showed them the king's son. You can see the strategy of this priest. He wants to unveil who this future heir is, but he also wants the buy-in from the people. He doesn't want to just say, look, mechanically, we have somebody who genetically uh, is the right lineage of King David. But for this to work, we need buy-in from the people of God. We need the people of God to step forward and say, we are making a fresh covenant with God, a commitment to the Lord. And this priest knew that for this to work, we have to have a commitment in the nation to the Lord, a, a fresh renewal of the covenant as, as this king is established because we are saying that we, we completely buy into the promises of God and the program of God. So notice this, he gets them together. First, he calls them to make a commitment. Then he reveals the king's son. I see this as a pattern. Sometimes we wonder, why doesn't God reveal more to me? Why doesn't God speak things to my heart? Why doesn't the Holy Spirit direct me like other people that I know say the Lord is? Well. Many times God is waiting for you to make that full commitment to him. And when you establish that commitment and that covenant, then he makes the revelation. It was John the Apostle who got a revelation of Jesus Christ when? When he was on the island of Patmos. Why was he on the island of Patmos? For the testimony of Jesus Christ. He was so sold out to Jesus, they tried to boil him in oil. The guy wouldn't burn, so they sent him off to an island. But he was there for the testimony. He was there because of the covenant, there because of the commitment. 
having made the commitment, being fully bought into the Lord's program, then the Lord gave him a revelation of Jesus Christ. So likewise, the priest wants them to make a commitment, then he's going to reveal the son, the heir. He showed them the king's son. Then he commanded them, that is the bodyguards, the captain of the hundreds, all that he assembled, he commanded them saying, this is what you shall do. One third of you who come on duty on the Sabbath shall be keeping watch over the king's house. One third shall be at the gate of Sur. One third shall be behind the escorts. You shall keep the watch of the house lest it be broken down. The two contingents of you who go off duty on the Sabbath shall keep the watch of the house of the Lord for the king. But you shall surround the king on all sides, every man with his weapons in his hand. And whoever comes within range, that is if somebody's going to bum rush you guys to kill this one thread of hope left, this little boy named Jehoash. If they come within range, let him be put to death. You are to be with the king as he goes out and as he comes in. So, interesting, you've got this high priest who has enough spiritual savvy to say we got to have a covenant with the people, but also has enough military savvy and he's pragmatic enough to say, look, let's make a covenant with God. At the same time, we need to involve the military. We have to have bodyguards. We have to have weaponry. We have to fight battles. We understand mankind is a fallen race. Our queen mother proves that over and over again. Athaliah. So he's spiritual and practical. He says we have to have weapons and defend ourselves and the program of God. Yes, we trust in God, but we keep our ammunition dry. You know, we might be called upon to fight. So he's very, very practical involving the people of God, involving the military in the nation, because this is going to be a problem when Athaliah finds out. She's been killing everybody. She's going to send her men in to kill this kid. Now, I can't resist this thought. So forgive me if I'm just stretching it a little bit, but I can't just get past it. The true king... The son, the heir of David, the son of David, the descendant of David, is revealed in the seventh year. He's seven years old. She's been in power six years, but in the, when he turns seven years of age, then the son is revealed. So there's coming a period of rough times on the earth where Satan just so usurps the power of God that during that time all havoc breaks loose. There's the Antichrist and there's a seven year period of tribulation, but at the end of the seven years, the Antichrist is put down, his reign is put down, Satan's reign is put down, the true son is revealed, the true king of kings and lord of lords comes and he is crowned lord of all. There just seems to be an interesting pattern. It's just something that isn't perhaps an example to us and written for our admonition. When you put it together, you see a similarity. So the captains of the hundreds did according to all that Jehoiada the priest commanded. Each of them took his men who were to be on duty on the Sabbath with those who were going off duty on the Sabbath and came to Jehoiada the priest. This is very clever, actually. Jehoiada wanted this done on the Sabbath because he knew the Sabbath is when there's the changing of the guard. So if you have the old guard about to go and the new guard about to come, you have twice as many people on the Sabbath as you would normally. So you're going to get more protection. And the priest gave the captains of the hundreds the spears, the shields, which belonged to King David that were in the temple of the Lord. This is the heir of David. It only makes sense that we take David's weaponry and if we have to, fight. Then the escort stood, every man with his weapons in his hand, all around the king. Now keep in mind, the king's a seven-year-old kid. From the right side of the temple to the left side of the temple, 
by the altar and the temple, and he brought out the king's son, put a crown on him, and gave him the testimony, that is the Torah, the five books of Moses, the law, a scroll. Can you imagine this seven-year-old kid being given a scroll, probably as big as he was, holding this big old gigantic scroll? So he gave him the testimony, gave him his own copy of the Bible, made him king and anointed him, and clapped their hands and said, Long live the king. Or the old translation says, God save the king. By the way, this verse is where the British monarchy got the practice on coronation day of its monarch, whether king or queen, to give the king or queen a copy of the Bible. From this verse. And they say, God save the king, or long live the king, or long live the queen comes from this practice, this verse. Now, when Athaliah heard the noise of the escorts and the people, she came to the people into the temple of the Lord. She hears all the noise. She hears the clapping and her ears pick up and she goes, people are clapping. That, that's my cue. They must be clapping for me. I'm their queen. And she's all excited and ready to march into the temple. She goes in. And when she looked, there was the king. She didn't know he was alive. Standing by a pillar according to custom. And the leaders and the trumpeters were by the king. And all the people of the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets. Of course they were happy. They were so sick of that old hag, <laughs> that vicious woman, that witch ruling. And now it's ding dong, the witch is dead. They got, a, they got the heir of the seed of David. They're so stoked that her reign is over. The book of Proverbs has a lot to say about wicked rulers and the people groaning. And when the righteous are in charge, the people rejoice. All the people of the land were rejoicing and blowing trumpets, and Athaliah tore her clothes and cried out, Treason! Treason! Really? <laughs> really, Athaliah? You're, you're saying this is treason? You're not even a descendant of David. You killed all of your grandkids. That's treason. You know, it's funny how this works in politics. You get the pot calling the kettle black. You know, it, th this is like Hamas saying Israel is a bunch of terrorists. A, a terrorist group accusing uh, a modern military that declares war according to law a group of terrorists. So here she's saying, this is treasonous. She kills her grandkids. She kills the royal heirs. She's not of the seed of David. She's a usurper, and she's crying out treason. Then Jehoiada, the priest, commanded the captains of the hundreds, the officers of the army, and said to them, take her outside under guard and slay her with the sword. Slay with the sword whoever follows her. For the priest said, do not let her be killed in the house of the Lord. Don't kill her in church. <laughs> Bad form to have blood, you know, and down the center aisle. Just take her outside and do her in out there and anybody who follows her. But don't let her be killed in the house of the Lord. Only sacrifices were to be uh, slain in the house of the Lord. So they seized her. And she went by the way of the horse's entrance to the king's house, and there she was killed. So the anti-king is killed. And after seven years, the true king emerges, sitting on the throne of David, and the people rejoice. Then Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord, the king, and the people that they should be the Lord's people. 
and also between, between the king and the people. So they made it with the Lord, and they made it between the king and the people, and all the people of the land went to the temple of Baal and tore it down. Now, we'll get to it later on, but in the book of Chronicles, we're told that Athaliah, one of the things she did is she went into the temple of God, the temple that Solomon had built. It was built 130 years prior. It had been there only 130 years. And, and here is the, the nation of Judah, only 130 years after the temple was built, and they have already turned away from God, and Athaliah brought in the worship of Baal into Jerusalem, and Chronicle says she took some of the stones and implements from the temple of God and used them, the materials from Solomon's temple, and used them in the temple of Baal. Can you imagine turning from God only 130 years after you build that temple to worship God? All that we know about Solomon. But think about it. We've been a nation coming up on 248 years. We, as a nation, have left many of the foundations this country was founded upon. Uh, trusting in the Lord, the Word of God, Bible taught in schools, uh, all of the things this that made this nation so great. We have so quickly turned away from these things, and a nation that turns away and forsakes the Lord, well, we know what the Bible has to say about that. So here you have God's own people who had made a covenant with God through David, through Solomon, down to one person hidden away from David's lineage, building a temple to Baal using the implements from the true temple using them in the temple of Baal. So now there's a new covenant, there's a new king, there's a new priest, a new vision, a revival of sorts. And so he makes this covenant with the people and they went into the temple of Baal, which was in Jerusalem, tore it down. They thoroughly broke in pieces its altars, images, and killed Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altars. And the priest appointed officials, officers, over the house of the Lord. Then he took captains of hundreds, the bodyguards, the escorts, all the people of the land, and they brought the king down from the house of the Lord and went by way of the gate of the escorts to the king's house, and he sat on the throne of the kings. So all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was quiet. The old witch is dead. The usurper is gone. The true king is crowned, though seven years of age, but he has a godly mentor in Jehoiada, the high priest. And now begins a succession of four fairly good kings in Judah. For about the next 100 years, including this guy, there's going to be four relatively good kings. Not perfect, but they're going in the right direction. For they had slain Athaliah with the sword in the king's house, and Jehoash was seven years old when he became king. Can you imagine what's going on in this little kid's head? Seven years old? King of a nation? You go, well, that's pretty scary to have somebody that young, king of a nation. Well, he was the youngest king historically that we know of in Judah. But by God's grace and with the help of the people he had around him, he does pretty well, as you will see. Not perfectly, but pretty well. So look, we've already finished one chapter. Chapter 12, verse 1. In the seventh year of Jehu, that's the guy up north. <laughs> Thank you for that applause. I <laughs> appreciate that. In the seventh year of Jehu, Jehoash, now remember, Jehoash or Joash, it's the same name. Sometimes it's Joash, sometimes it's Jehoash. Sometimes that previous king in the north was Joram, sometimes he was Jehoram. You're going, oh, I hate that. It's so confusing. Why did they do that? Well, we do that. We have 
Jonathan, we have Johnny, we have John, we have Charles, Chuck, uh, we have Nathan, we have Nate, you know, we have nicknames for a lot of people. They, they can sort of go between these names. So in the seventh year of Jehu, Joash, Jehoash, became king. He reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. So if he reigned 40 years, he was seven years old when he became king. He died at what age? 47 years of age. You go, that's too young to die. What, what disease did he die of? He didn't die of a disease. He gets murdered, tragically, as you will see. So he became king at seven years old. He reigned for 40 years, so he dies at 47. His mother's name was Zibia of Beersheba. Beersheba is down south, so mom's a southerner. Uh, down in Beersheba, the desert regions of the area. Jehoash did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Now watch this. All the days in which Jehoiada the priest instructed him. That's a qualifier. That last little part of the sentence tells you to what extent he did right. He did good. He did right in the sight of the Lord all the days in which Jehoiada the priest instructed him. So we have a king, a little kid, seven years of age, but one who is fortunate enough to have a godly mentor. Because he has a godly mentor, he becomes a godly politician as long as that mentor is alive. So, so far so good. But since it's going to be a while before we get to uh, Second Chronicles, and by then we're going to forget what we read in Second Kings, I'm going to turn now over to Second Chronicles. You may want to turn there as well. Second Chronicles, chapter 24. You just turn right a couple blocks till you get to Second Chronicles. You'll see it at the top of your Bible. Second Chronicles, chapter 24. It gives us a little more of the details of the story of this young king. Now look at verse 15 of 2 Chronicles 24. But Jehoiada, that's the high priest, grew old and was full of days, and he died. That's what happens when you're full of days. You get enough days under your belt, you just die. And he was 130 years old when he died. That's a lot of days. So he's an old codger. And uh, he lived long enough to keep this young boy, one-year-old, hidden until he was seven years of age. He and his wife kept him in the temple, uh, unbeknownst to anybody. Uh, he himself was old, but he dies at 130. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and his house. Now after the death of Jehoiada, the leaders of Judah came and bowed down to the king. Now watch this. And the king listened to them. New group. Mentor's dead. Jehoiada's dead. The godly influence is dead. He's got younger, more vibrant, cooler, hepper leaders around him. He wants to fit in with them and that group. And, you know, the old generation, that's, well, that's the old generation. Therefore, they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served wooden images and idols, and wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem because of their trespass. Yet he sent prophets, that is, the Lord sent prophets to them to bring them back to the Lord, and they testified against them, but they would not listen." Jehoiada is dead, the mentor is dead, the high priest is dead. Without him, Jehoash is unstable. Why? Because he has leaned on the faith of his mentor. He has lived by the spiritual momentum of his mentor. You take his mentor out of it, he doesn't have his own legs of faith, his own relationship with God. So when the mentor is gone, other influences quickly turn him aside. Be careful if your faith is propped up 
by the faith of others. It's good to have the faith of others. We are the body of Christ, the joints and ligaments that keep us stable in the body of Christ. But you need to grow your own set of faith legs and have your own walk with the Lord. You can't rely on the spiritual momentum or the spiritual status of parents, grandparents, friends. But I see this so often. You have a, a godly spouse who dies, and then the remaining spouse leaves church, leaves the faith, doesn't read the Bible. You know, oh, I've been to church in years. I meet people all the time. Oh, I used to go to your church. Well, where are you going now? Nowhere. Well, how's your walk now? Oh, I, I, saw, I believe. What, in the universe? <laughs> but so often it's because their faith isn't really strong. It's They've got somebody who's strong for them. So God sent prophets to course correct. It didn't work. So uh, judgment follows. So we have Joash. He did what was right as long as the mentor was alive. So you have this king who's a good follower but not a good leader. And as, as a good follower, he followed the strong underpinnings of Jehoiada. Once Jehoiada is gone... He's easily influenced by others who are younger and hipper and cooler and go in a very different direction. And it doesn't take long. So, back to 2 Kings. Jehoash did what was right, verse 2, in the sight of the Lord all the days in which Jehoiada the priest instructed him. But, and here's the but part, is not good when you're doing right in the sight of the Lord, but the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. Now, we read about these high places a lot in the Old Testament, right? Don't we? Do you know what they are? High places are high places. They're elevated places. Hills are a high place as opposed to the valley. And that is, it's the old idea that you are closer to the deity you worship when you're higher in elevation than when you're down low. Um, this was a belief in all of that region, including in Israel. Remember, the law of Moses was given on Mount Sinai. Moses went up and received the revelation of God and came down to the people. It was all symbolic. Well, that symbolism was not only in Israel, but in various religious institutions of the Middle East. So uh, in, in the Old Testament, God, Yahweh, the true God, was often worshipped in high places, in different little areas, different hills around Judah and Israel. Now this is interesting to me because in the law, in the Torah, God said, you won't just worship me anywhere, but only in the place that I choose. I'm going to choose a place, and this is called the law of the central sanctuary. I'm going to choose a place to put my name. There you will bring sacrifices. There you will worship me. And God says three times a year, you're all going to come. You're all going to gather. You're all going to remember together in a central place. But... What happened to Israel is they fell prey to this ideology of convenience. Well, let's not be so legalistic and have to go that long trek down to the temple of Jerusalem. This is what the, the high places up in Samaria and Bethel and Dan, right? The two golden calves were all about. Why go down to Jerusalem? Just worship here. They made it convenient. Well, this became an ideology where, yes, it was Yahweh that was worshipped, but worshipped in their own way, not in a legalistic way, not you have to go down to Jerusalem and go through all that palaver and the priest. Let's just have our own kind of deal here. You know, I don't go to church, man. I'm not an, into organized religion. My church is the 17th green or on the beach. I'm close to God there. You know, I've just sort of, I have a religion, a worship of convenience. I don't need to gather together like the New Testament tells us to. Beware of a religion of convenience. 
So the high places, they worshiped Yahweh. So what happened in these high places, because Baal worship and other idolatry got peppered into it, it was first the high places were worshiping Yahweh, God, the true God, but in their own way, their own desires, their own convenience. But then it became syncretistic, that is, other gods and goddesses were worshipped alongside of Yahweh. So now Yahweh is placed in the pantheon of all the other religious deities. He's put on the same level as different gods and goddesses. So you go to a high place and somebody says, hey dude, you worship your god in your way, I worship my god in my way. You had that going on. And so uh, he did what was right in refurbishing the house of the Lord as we're about to see, but he kept the high places going. So, but the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burned incense in the high places. And Jehoash said to the priests, this little seven-year-old king now is growing up and he's starting to make um, known what should be done. He's starting to craft policy. And this is a good policy. Jehoash said to the priests, all the money of the dedicated gifts that are brought into the house of the Lord, each man's census money, census money is the half shekel that every Israelite had to pay, according to the book of Numbers. Each man's assessment money, that's like your income tax and property tax, and all the money that a man purposes in his heart to bring into the house of the Lord, let the priests take it themselves, each from his constituency, and let them repair the damages of the temple wherever any dilapidation is found. So remember, Athaliah had taken material out of the temple to build the temple of Baal. Now the temple of Baal is down. So there's dilapidation, breaches in the walls, natural deterioration, and some of the things that were stolen to put in another temple. Let's restore the infrastructure of the temple. So now it was in the verse 6, now it was so by the 23rd year of King Jehoash that the priests had not repaired the damages of the temple. So King Jehoash called Jehoiada the priest and the other priests and said to them, why have you not repaired the damages of the temple? Now therefore do not take any more money from your constituency but deliver it for the repairing of the damages of the temple. What I think was happening as we'll see as we read on is that the priest took the money and instead of paying for infrastructure like new stonework and woodwork and things like that. Um, they used it for silver and gold and some of the pretty fancy stuff like you had to have pans and um, um, lighters, wickers, shovels, things like that for the implements of the sacrifice. But it was all the shiny glittery stuff, the pretty stuff they spent the money on instead of the infrastructure. Now, I understand this. I understand this, it's like, man, it'd be nice to like, you know, get the new technology and, and yeah, but we have a leaky roof and, and it's gonna cost a whole lot of money or we need air conditioners or you need the parking lot paved. Oh man, that, it's so expensive. You know, you, you, it, it's, but it has to be done. So he is faced with the fact that the money that is coming in from the census, from the property taxes, and from the free will offerings, it's not enough to do it all. So he has to make a call. So verse 8, the priests agreed that they would neither receive any more money from the people nor repair the damages of the temple. Then Jehoiada the priest took a chest, bored a hole in its lid, and set it beside the altar on the right side as one comes into the house of the Lord and put the priests who kept the door, put there all the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. So whenever they saw that there was much money in the chest that the king scribe, so the box is filling up, that the king scribe and the high priest came up and put it in bags and counted the money that was found in the house of the Lord and they gave the money which had been apportioned into the hands of those who did the work who had oversight of the house of the Lord and they paid it out to the carpenters, the builders 
and those who worked on the house of the Lord. So he now takes it to the private sector as a free will offering. He puts a, a big chest with a hole in it. It says, if you want to give to repairing the house of the Lord, give here. But it's up to you. Now, as you came in the church tonight and every week, you notice these boxes with a hole in the lid. Did you not? These little black wooden boxes that have been here for years since we started. Now you know where we got the idea for the agape box. When we first started this fellowship in a movie theater and the leaders came to me and said, okay, so when are we going to receive the offering uh, during the service? I said, we're not going to receive an offering. We're going to put a coffee can in the foyer and put a little slit in the lid. And we did a coffee can instead of a box because box, you know, you got to go buy wood, a coffee can. You just empty out the coffee when it's done and put a uh, slit in the lid. It's cheap. So I put one coffee can on one side of the foyer in the movie theater. And uh, they said, well, one can isn't enough. I said, okay, we'll put, it, put two cans, one over on the other side. So if you were to come in the very first Sunday morning in Calvary Chapel in the Far North Cinema Theater, uh, you would be greeted by friendly people and two co Folgers coffee. <laughs> and, you know, it had a little sign on it that if you want to give to the Lord, give here. So that's how we started. And as the church began to grow and it became bigger, they came to me again and said, okay, so that worked for the theater. Uh, we, we, we can't keep doing that. I said, well, why not? It's worked so far. And so we've just enlarged the footprint of the coffee can and made boxes. And these boxes have been here for decades, same boxes, and um, seem to work seem to take care of it as the Lord lays upon people's hearts. Now, we do receive a formal offering from time to time, but you will notice we only receive offerings for special occasions for needs other than our own, for mission work, for reload love, for projects we're doing for Thanksgiving that go above and beyond the care of the house. But other than that, this is how the Lord has seen fit to fund it without lots of high pressure. So if you're wondering, well, where did all that come from? Now you, now you know where we stole the idea from. Now I forget which verse I... 12. And to the masons and stonecutters, so they gave directly to the contractors. They just paid him directly. He was paid to repair the temple. However, there was not made for the house of the Lord basins of silver, trimmers, all the silver, gold, shiny stuff, uh, sprinkling bowls, trumpets, articles of gold, articles of silver from the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. But they gave that to the workmen. They repaired the house of the Lord with it. Moreover, they did not require an account from the men into whose hand they delivered the money to be paid to workmen, for they dealt faithfully. So these guys were just so honest. Um, they just trusted them, and they did it. The money from the trespass offerings and the money from the sin offering was not brought into the house uh, of the Lord. It belonged to the priests. Now, Hazael, king of Syria, went up and fought against Gath and took it. So Hazael set his face to go up to Jerusalem. Stop there. Think back a few chapters. Think back when Elisha sent somebody to speak to Jehu, but he... Elisha went to the northern part, to Syria. Remember when Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, was sick? And his general, Hazael, uh, was in town. And so Elisha comes up to Damascus, up to Syria, and they go, hey, that man of God's in town. And so Ben-Hadad said, good, go find out if I'm going to get better, because I'm sick, and the man of God will be able to tell you if I'm going to recover or not. And, and give him a big gift. So Hazael gave him a, put 40 camels worth of trinkets on and gave, wanted to give it to Elisha. 
And uh, he says, hey, the king wants to know if he's going to live and if he's going to recover. And, and uh, Elisha said, well, go tell the king he's going to recover. He's not going to die from his illness, but the Lord has really shown me he's dead. And, that's, and, then, and then Elisha looked at Hazael and started weeping. Remember that? And just stared at him and started weeping. And Hazael felt really embarrassed, uncomfortable. He goes, what are you crying for? He goes, the Lord has shown me you're going to be the next king. And the reason I'm crying is because I can see the unspeakable horror you're going to do to God's people. Remember that? Now we have that Hazael waging war, not just against Samaria, but all the way down south in Jerusalem. So he goes down to Gath. Now Gath was one of the Philistine cities. Remember when the Philistines were in the land, they, they were in control of five cities. Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gath, Gaza, Ekron. So he goes to Gath, one of the Philistine cities, southwest of Jerusalem, like 21 miles. Lay siege on it. Now he's headed toward Jerusalem to fight against Jehoash. And Jehoash, verse 18, king of Judah, took all the sacred things that his fathers, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, and Ahaziah, kings of Judah, had dedicated, and his own sacred things, all the gold found in the treasuries of the house of the Lord and in the king's house, and sent them to Hazael, the king of Syria. Then he went away from Jerusalem. What is he doing? He's paying him off. He's buying him off. He's thinking, oh, they're coming up to get me. He, he's now not trusting the Lord. He does, get this, what Athaliah did. Remember, Athaliah took the temple of God, sacked it from all of these things, and put it in the temple of Baal, leaving it a shell, the temple of God. Now the king, who went through this elaborate project of rebuilding the temple, takes all of the treasures out of the temple, like Athaliah, but not putting him in the temple of Baal, but giving it to a pagan king from the north to buy him off politically. He made a business choice instead of a spiritual choice. Leaving the temple a shell, which speaks of his own life. His own life was a shell. You know, he was serving the Lord while Jehoiada was the priest, but now he's doing his own thing with the young leaders of the land, and his life spiritually is just a shell, empty. And so Hazael returned back to Syria, away from Jerusalem. So you've got Jehoash, without Jehoiada, is, is a rudderless king. He's not, he's not being instructed in the Bible any longer turned away from instruction. Jehoiada gave him good biblical instruction. This is why we need to keep studying our Bible, stay committed to going through the scriptures, stay committed to coming to church, showing up, receiving instruction. Oh, I've heard this stuff before. Stay committed to it. Now, the rest of the acts of Joash... And all that he did, are they not written in the books of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? Why, yes, they are. And his servants arose, made a conspiracy, and killed Joash. How old was Joash when he was killed? 47. That's why he died at 47. Because of a conspiracy, and they killed Joash in the house of the Milo, which goes down to Selah. I know these are just weird names to you. But actually, when you come with us to Israel, when that door opens up, we're not doing it in 24, we're now postponing it to 25 for obvious reasons. But when you go and we take you to this area of Jerusalem called the City of David, and above us is the Temple Mount, and we're going down from there to, into the city of David. Um, you who have been to Israel, you know when you're on the southern steps of the temple? Those, those big uh, set of steps 
Jesus and the disciples went up. We have a Bible study there and a worship service there. And you look down through the valley and you see the city of David before you. And then from there, we, we go down into the city of David. There's an old stone structure that is sort of at a slant of about a 40, 35 degree slant, a stepped structure. It's part of the old city walls of Jerusalem. It is believed by archaeologists that that step structure you can still see to this day was the Milo. Milo just means a fortification where earth is built up. It's built up in a mound. It's fortified with rock. That was called the Milo. It goes down to Silah. If you keep going down into the Kidron Valley, there's a village called Silwan, even to this day. That's the area. So that's where he was killed. You can stand and see the area where this took place. Four, Josachar, the son of Sh Shemaoth, and Jehozabad, the son of Shomer, his servants struck him, so he died, and they buried him with his fathers in the city of David. And Amaziah, don't confuse him with Ahaziah, Ahaziah is gone, buried dead. Amaziah, his son, reigned in his place. Two chapters, baby. We did it. It's, I know, it's just, it's, it's a big deal for a guy who goes so slow. So thank you for your indulgence. Thank you, Father, for your word. Against we are, again, we are reminded that these were all, th these things happened to them as examples and were written for our admonition, our instruction. And so, Lord, we living in these days, reading about these events that happened so long ago, can see human nature is unchanged. People are people. And um, we need good godly mentors. We need good godly examples. But... At the end of the day, we need our own relationship with you, our own understanding, our own Jesus revolution. We need you to work in our lives, Lord, and our children need that expression and experience in their own lives. Apart from parents, grandparents, apart from friends and mentors, we need to explore what it is to trust you even in difficult times. And Lord, what a beautiful reminder that though we can't see your promises, there's so much that is hidden. When evil queens are ruling and evil kings are ruling, you have a Jehoash hidden somewhere. You've got your plan about to be worked out, to be unveiled at the right time. Thank you, Lord. I pray that our faith would be so built up that because of it, our families would thrive, our neighborhoods would thrive, our place of business would thrive, our circle of friends would be blessed and thrive, and this city would be blessed because of your blessing in our lives. In Jesus' name. For more resources from Calvary Church in Skip Heitzig, visit calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us from this teaching in our series, Expound.